Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the program. My name is William Hemsworth. Great to be with you all. Our friend Ken Litchfield is back. Ken is the author of a great book called How Old Is Your Church? An Introductory Guide to Catholic Apologetics. We're kind of re-recording an episode. About a month ago, we recorded one about you know Jesus, Jesus' divinity, and the audio was uh, way subpar. So we're getting together again. We're going to redo this thing. Uh, so, Ken, thanks for your patience on this. How are you doing today? I'm doing well. How's William? You know, I am doing well. It's a beautiful Saturday morning here, and it's getting hot here in Arizona. The time has come. So it's all right, though. <laughs> it was 38 degrees here this morning. <laughs> so. Oh, wow. Uh, yeah, I think the I think the think this morning it's 63. It's supposed to get up to 95. So wow. we're, we're not quite in the hundreds yet, but we're getting there. And like I said, the time's come. I said, and it's almost our rainy season. It gets hot and humid. It rains, and then... Just how it is. It's all right. So again, thanks for coming on. Appreciate all the work that you're doing um, with Gary's show coming on mine, uh, spreading the truths of our faith. It's always great to talk to you. Yeah, I'm going to be on Gary's show on Monday, and uh, our mutual friend David, the Catholic Canuck, I'm going to be on with him next Saturday. So, all right, said, David. Say hi to you. Yeah, David Scubin. He's a great guy. Awesome uh-huh. guy. Glad you're going to be on with him. Yeah, I'll yep. be on. I'll be on Gary's show on the 18th. We're going to talk about, did the church fathers teach the rapture? I'm kind of looking forward to that. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> I got a chapter on that in my book. <laughs> yes, you do. Yes. Yeah. Great book. Recommend everyone get it. So our topic, uh, Jesus, you know, did Jesus say he was God? So I guess, Ken, I guess, where could we start off with that? Cause some people will say that Jesus didn't make this claim directly. I mean, did he, did he, or did he not? I guess we can start there. Right. Yeah, the big question is, did Jesus claim he was God, or was he just a great teacher and rabbi? And, uh, you know, if Jesus was just a great teacher, you know, we can compare him to, like, Muhammad and Buddha, who never claimed to be God, but they were great moral teachers. Um, Muhammad claimed his teachings were from God, uh, and he passed on his teachings, Jesus also passed on his teachings. Buddha, you know, just claimed to offer a way to get yourself out of existence and into mm-hmm. nirvana and be separate from this physical world. But because God made this world, we know that, you know, physical things are from God and as well as spiritual things. So we don't have to be afraid of the spirit, spiritual and physical world together. So the question is, like, as C.S. Lewis and Lee Strobel propose, is Jesus a liar, a lord, a lunatic, or the Lord? Right. So Jesus could have been a crazy man going around claiming to be God. However, he performed many miracles, at first in secret and then later on in public. Jesus healed many people of diseases and deformities. He transformed water into wine. He multiplied bread and fish at least twice. Jesus could be lying, but many people witnessed his miracles and were willing to die for that witness, not just, you know, deny Jesus to save their life. Mm-hmm. Now, now, Ken, how, how, what would you say to someone who says, well... Jesus could have been a liar, and they and they maybe point to other cult leaders in the present day. I don't know, like like David Koresh, for example, or Jim Jones, where their their followers follow them and you know die and all that. What would you say to what would you say to those people who maybe equate what the disciples did being martyred to some of these other groups? Right. Well, the disciples witnessed Jesus dying and being resurrected and all of his miracles. Um, David Koresh or other cult leaders may have convinced people that they speak for God or were giving them correct teaching, um, but they didn't perform miracles and they certainly didn't rise from the dead as we know by the end of their cult. You know, right. None of those cult leaders came back. Um, but. Jesus' death and resurrection is recorded by the Roman historian 
Tacitus and the Jewish historian Josephus in the first century. They could never account for the empty tomb. And the fact that these outside witnesses attest to Jesus' death and resurrection shows us that the Christians were valid in believing in Jesus' death and resurrection as well. Um, also, like Jesus' resurrection was witnessed by women who were considered like second-class citizens and not generally credible witnesses in court. Yet, in the Bible, those are the first witnesses of Jesus' resurrection. So, we put out our worst witnesses first. And then later on, we talk about how over 500 people witnessed that Jesus had risen from the dead. Right, and I think that's an important point because if you're trying to start a new movement based on a lie, and I mean no disrespect to the ladies out there, but in ancient times, that's not how you, not how you would start it. Right. <laughs> so In the Jewish culture, you had to have like two women to attest to something for it to be considered as credible as one man. Uh, and, you know, it seems amazing to our modern mind, but that was the culture at the time. Right. And, you know, Jesus' death and resurrection is recorded within five to ten years of its occurring. You know, that's in the historical documents that we have. It may have even been written down earlier. But also, too, at that time, you know, there wasn't a, a Jewish newspaper published every day, you know, telling about the incidents that happened in Jerusalem that day. Uh, so things are passed on through word of mouth more than by writing, which, again, seems odd to our modern mind, but it was the way the culture existed back then. Because a lot of people couldn't read and write, and, you know, there was... It wasn't easy to spread reading and writing, <laughs> um, at least writing, you know, because the printing press hadn't been developed yet, uh, and everything had to be written by hand, and the writing materials were expensive on top of that. Right. Now, Ken, which historical documents um, attest to the resurrection within that time period? You said five to ten years after the event. Um, let's see. Paul's writings... Um, Let's see. Some people, there's debate between whether uh, Corinthians or Colossians, I believe, was written first. Okay. Uh, but those are like the earliest writings that we have from the New Testament. And Paul writes about how Jesus rose from the dead. And that's one of the, the credentials that he gives the people that he's preaching to. And he talks about how if Jesus hasn't written, risen from the dead, then our faith is in vain. You know, there's no sense being a Christian if Jesus didn't rise from the dead. Um, and normally it takes like, you know, 100 to 200 years for a myth to develop. And, you know, we have historical writings from five to ten years after Jesus uh, resurrection and ascension to heaven and another thing it being written by paul who wasn't even there well he was quite possibly in jerusalem at the time when it happened but he wasn't even a christian at the time he wasn't a follower of jesus so you could even count him as a hostile witness as well right and the other thing is it's like the church that jesus founded is still here 2,000 years later. Uh, all the other, you know, cults, sects, whatever you want to call them, you know, came and went, and there were different versions of Christianity early on, and they all faded away. The church that Jesus founded is still here because he promised to be with his church until the end of the age. Now, can you mention uh, Saint Paul with uh, First Corinthians? And in there, he's, you know, he's pretty much saying, you know, you don't believe what I'm saying. There's 500 people that our Lord appeared to. He's kind of like challenged them to go ask them. Um, I guess what's the historical significance 
of of that because I think sometimes we lose track of that in the modern sense. Right. Well, if you have 500 people that had seen Jesus since his resurrection, that adds a lot more credibility. And by t- people being able to go and talk to other witnesses, and you know, Paul is daring them to go walk, talk to these other witnesses. You know, he's so confident in what he knows that you know, just ask anybody, <laughs> right? And they'll tell you. <laughs> All right, good. And so they said, C.S. Lewis and Lee Strobel said he's, the, you know, a, how was it, a liar, lord, or a lunatic? Right. So was so I guess was he lying or was he a lunatic? Is yes, the start uh, there? Was he a lunatic? I, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, there are some crazy people that go around claiming to be God. But Jesus showed that he was not just a lunatic by performing miracles um, and, um, you know, giving the teachings of the Old Testament to the to his followers and um, living as a Jew the way you were supposed to live, not... Um, as like a modern secular Jew that, you know, just goes along with the rest of society and they don't even practice their ancient faith as it was practiced back then. Okay. So Jesus walked the walk and talked the talk. So in performing miracles on top of that, you know, adds a whole lot to the credibility. Right. Okay, good. So he wasn't just crazy, and he wasn't lying. Uh, so we have to recognize that he's Lord. Now, there's a lot more evidence to show that he was Lord. Um, and we also have to lay the foundation that, you know, whether God exists or not. Mm-hmm. And the God of Christianity is like God outside of time and space because he's the origin of time and space. So we recognize Jesus as the son of God and pre-exists his coming to earth as the word of God, um, as we find in John 1, 1. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. And don't let the Jehovah Witnesses tell you he was a God. He really was, was God. <laughs> I was just thinking that, Ken. You read my mind. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so the God of Christianity is the source of all creation, that which existed before anything else existed. Um, you could consider the God of Christianity as the source of the Big Bang. Um, and, you know, scientists try to get around the Big Bang by claiming there was, you know, some... Uh, pre-atomic, subatomic ether that existed before the Big Bang, but, you know, this subatomic ether, well, that's not nothing. That's still something. Right. It might not have been organized into anything, but it was still something. But God creates from nothing. Right, and that's so, a basic, it's a basic scientific principle that nothing can't, that something can't come from nothing. Right. So. so it takes a whole lot of faith to believe that something can come from nothing when your whole scientific principle teaches that something can't come from nothing. You, right. It's a, a logical contradiction that if scientists you know, really think deep about it, it's like, well, they have to come to the conclusion that, yes, there is a God. So... There's also, you know, the creation of just our universe, you know, depends on more than 10 different parameters that have to be finely tuned to make things come out the way they are now. And so even if a scientist wants to claim that, you know, this Big Bang happened and there were millions of examples or trillions, 
quadrillions of examples, and we just happen to be in the one that came out right. Um, the you can think of like you know, all those examples, you know, happened to come together, and, and we ended up in the good one. Um, but on the other hand, if you consider all the ten parameters that have to be finely tuned to get what we have, the chances become so minutely small that you would need a whole lot more than quadrillions of examples before you get to what we have. So really, it shows that you know what we have had to be at least finely tuned to end up the way we did. And evolution doesn't really accom uh, accommodate the uh, explosion of vertebrates in the Cambrian period. You know, everything was supposed to develop slowly over time, but in the Cambrian period, there's a whole lot of new species coming into existence, at least according to the scientific historical record. So okay. this highly suggests that there's intelligent design behind what we have. And the source of that intelligent design for us Christians is God. All right. So then uh, we can start with the Old Testament. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was, I was to say, so we have intelligent design. We have God as creator as found in the book of Genesis, and it's attested to throughout all of scripture. And so I was just about to say, and you, you read my mind on there. So how about the Old Testament? Where, where can we start from there? Right. Well, there's over 600 predictions in the Old Testament that Jesus fulfills. So we won't try and cover all of those. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, you know, way back in Genesis 22, we are told that uh, the Messiah would have to be of, uh, let's see, Semitic descent, you know, through Abraham. Mm -hmm. And Jesus is a, a son of Abraham through Isaac and Jacob and David and on down the line. Uh, we also know that he's from the line of Jake, Jacob, who's in Abraham's grandson, um, as shown in Numbers 24. Uh, and from Isaiah 11, we know that Jesus is from the line of Jesse, the father of King David. And Isaiah has at least 13 different uh, predictions that the Messiah will be from the line of David um, that Jesus fulfilled. In Jeremiah 23, uh, we know that he is from the line of the King of David. And Jesus is from the line of David legally through Joseph. So mm -hmm. in, I believe, Matthew's gospel, you know, he right. shows Jesus' lineage back to, to David, um, basically through Joseph's line. Luke gives us a different line back to David. Um, and many Bible scholars consider like that's Jesus' lineage through Mary. But... The important thing is that both of them trace Jesus back to David, whether they have all the same people in the list or not. You know, because there are so many generations in between David and Jesus, you know, things change over time. Um, you know, there's lots of different branches to the tree that bring you back to the root of David. All right, but Ma Matthew going through that genealogy, that lineage was was really. A lot of people overlook that. It's very important to list that he's in the heir of the Davidic king that to fulfill the those Old Testament prophecies like you were talking about. Exactly. You know, the Messiah was to be from the line of David. And, you know, so Jesus needed to be from the line of David. And the lineage in the New Testament, you know, traces him back to David of the Old Testament. Right. Uh, in Samuel, Jesus uh, all affirms that uh, Jesus is from the King David. Uh, let's see. It says in Samuel chapter seven, Second Samuel chapter seven, when your days are over and you rest with your fathers, I will raise up your 
offspring to succeed you who will come from your own body and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. So that's another important key that Jesus is from the line of David. He's a successor to King David. And uh, because God promised that David would always have a successor on the throne and Jesus sits on the throne of David in heaven. Um, from the prophet Micah in chapter 5, we know he was born into the tribe of Judah. And from Isaiah 7, we know that he was born of a virgin. Um, and that Jesus would be worshipped by shepherds from the desert and that foreign kings would present him gifts is revealed in Psalm 72. And so like when Jesus was born and King Herod slaughtered a number of children in an attempt to kill him, this is predicted in Jeremiah chapter 31, uh, where it says, A voice is heard in Ramah, mourning and great weeping, Rachel weeping for her children, and refusing to be comforted because they are no more. And then it also predicts in there that, you know, he would come from the land of Egypt. And that's why Joseph is told in a dream to go to take Mary and Jesus and flee to the land of Egypt so that Herod can't kill them. Right. Okay. Um, especially important, uh, most of the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, but there is one exception in Daniel. 713 where the son of man was written in aramaic um, and it's written as bar anasha um, whereas the hebrew of the old testament where it refers to the son of man refers to ben adam so mm. there's a difference between being the son of god and the son of man through adam and interesting the Go ahead. I was saying that's interesting. Never thought of that. So. Yeah. So the, the Son of Man, you know, in a good translation, Son of Man, when it refers to Jesus, will be capital S and capital M. It's a, it's a sign of divinity then, uh, a mark of divinity. Okay, gotcha. Right. Um, whereas the Son of Man from Adam would be, you know, lowercase s and lowercase m. Okay. Okay. Um, Interesting to note that the uh, the oldest copies, like the Codex Sinaiticus, uh, Codex Vaticanus, and the Codex Alexandrius, uh, that's all written in what they call Unical script, where it's all capital Greek letters. So uh, translators over time have, you know, based on other writings and everything have put together the Bible as we have it now in English and they'll add the capital letters where they're appropriate and use the lowercase letters to make it much easier for us to read. Okay. Uh, another problem with the those old writings is like the letters are all just kind of crammed together. There's no punctuation. Um, so people learn to read those based on a teacher you know they wouldn't just pick up the book and read it you know somebody would show them how to read it you know this is where this word ends this is where that word starts this is the next sentence um so in our modern times we are very spoiled with a bible that is um well laid out good punctuation has all the letters chapter and verse chapter all that stuff verse, that wasn't yeah. around back then <laughs> right we are so spoiled, and now you can just type in, you know, some keywords and get all the, you know, verses that relate to that word and things like that. Uh, it was a whole lot harder to be a Christian back then. Um, let's see. So while Hebrew and Aramaic are related languages, the words are different, uh, which means the Son of Man in Daniel 7.13 is completely unique. Uh see and like Daniel also has the son of man in chapter 8 but it's in lowercase son of man because it refers to descendants Daniel as a descendant of Adam 
Oh, okay. Whereas the Son of Man that will be coming in the clouds and like that is what written with a capital S and a capital M because that's the divine nature coming. Um, so the phrase Son of Man is used 88 times in the New Testament when Jesus refers to the, the Son of Man in Matthew chapters 12 and 13 and Luke chapter 12 and John chapter 1. Uh, he's referring to himself as the Son of Man, not just a Son of Adam. And that's why a good translation will have the capital S and capital M there. When uh, St Stephen is being martyred in Acts chapter 7, he also refers to the Son of Man, uh, again with a capital S and a capital M. So there's a whole lot more in the New Old Testament, but let's move on to the New Testament. <laughs> oh, sure. Now, Kent, just real quick, you mentioned there's over 600 prophecies from the Old Testament that Jesus fulfilled. Do you know the probability of one person being able to fulfill all those? Um, you know, it would be highly rare that one person would do that. Um, again, we're talking like, you know, billions and trillions to one. Uh, so the fact that Jesus fulfilled all those prophecies, I'm not really sure how the Jews can continue to deny that Jesus is not their Messiah, uh, except from lack of knowledge. Uh, you know, to deny 600 prophecies being fulfilled is pretty tough. Yeah, Cog uh, cognitive dis cognitive dissonance, I guess. Right. <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. If you just okay. don't want to believe it, then you'll jump through hoops to not believe it. All right, so we went through some of the Old Testament. How about the New Testament? I guess where does Jesus make that divine claim in the in the New Testament? Right. Well, in the New Testament, in uh, Matthew chapter three, when Jesus is baptized, uh, a voice from heaven is heard to say. This is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. And we have to understand in the Jewish culture, you know, this is a time of kings and kingdoms, that the king who sits on the throne, his son would be the heir to that kingdom. And so when his son goes out, he represents his father wherever he goes. And just like in our modern times, uh, Queen Elizabeth, her son um, Charles, when he goes out, he represents her in the world. And so when King Elizabeth dies, you know, Charles will take the throne, um, unless he's not eligible anymore for since he was divorced. But since his wife is not first wife is now dead, maybe he's still eligible. That's up for the Anglicans to sort out, not me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I'm sure they can figure it out. <laughs> they have to. <laughs> and maybe Elizabeth will outlive, you know, Charles. <laughs> Who knows? Um, but, you know, again, like in the, uh, the story of the prodigal son, when the younger son leaves his father's household and goes off to sin, you know, the father, you know, explains to his oldest son that, you know, everything that the father has belongs to that older son. He gets all the inheritance. Um, so what the, what the father has belongs to the son. It's just a matter of time until the father passes on and it transfers to the son. Um, in Matthew chapter 16, Simon Peter asked, answers Jesus' question, who do men say that I am? And Jesus, or Peter answers Jesus, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus tells him, you know, this has been revealed to you by my Father. This is not something that you figured out on your own. And, and that's how Peter came to know it. It was revealed to him by God. So just looking at the New Testament from a historical viewpoint, you know, these are testimonies 
in the New Testament that testify to Jesus. And it's backed up by the miracles and his resurrection that he is actually from God. Uh, in Matthew chapter 17, uh, during on the Mount of Transfiguration, while Jesus was speaking with the uh, Moses and Elijah, a voice from heaven is heard to say, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. So God tells him twice, you know, this is my son. Listen to him. In Luke chapter 22, uh, we have, but now, but from now on, the son of man will be seated at the right hand of the power of God. So this is Jesus being in heaven with God on his throne. And later on in Luke chapter 22, and they, it says, and they all said, are you the son of God then? And he said to them, yes, I am. And I am echoes back to when God's, God spoke to Moses, giving him, well, before he gave him the Ten Commandments, you know, Moses says to him, who shall I say sent me? And God tells him, tells Moses, tell them, I am sent you. Right, and, after so, Jesus, and after Jesus said this, uh, they wanted to kill him because they were so upset that he was claiming this for himself. He wouldn't do that if it was, if he wasn't making that divine claim. Right. You know, if you claim to be God and you don't really, and you're not really God, you know, you're really asking for it when you're speaking to a bunch of Jews. And yet God protects Jesus and um, he walks through the crowd, even though they were ready to stone him. Right. Uh, and John's gospel, you know, is where we have a lot of testimony to Jesus' divinity because John's gospel was written later and a lot of, uh, he kind of like, John fills in the gaps that we don't learn in the other gospels. And he's mostly affirming Jesus' divinity mm -hmm. uh, and not always in a straightforward way because since John wrote later and Christianity was pretty well established and being heavily persecuted already by the Jews and the Romans, uh, John has to kind of identify Jesus' uh, divinity, but in a subtle way. Uh, but we have, as we mentioned earlier in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And Jesus says the Word of God pre-exists mm -hmm. everything else, but he comes into actual physical resistance when he took on flesh through Mary. And in John chapter 5, Jesus says, And the Father who sent me, he has testified of me. And you have, he's speaking to the Jews that are denying him, you have neither heard his voice at any time or seen his form. Uh, later on in John chapter 5, uh, he writes, or he says, there's another who testifies of me, and I know the testimony that he gives about me is true. And that would be like the prophets that, you know, foretold Jesus. And in 1 John chapter 5, uh, John writes, if we receive the testimony of men, the testimony of God is greater, for the testimony of God is this, that he has testified concerning his son. So here in 1 John, he's referring back to where God said, you know, this is my only begotten son, listen to him. And so he's affirming what, you know, Matthew wrote decades before John wrote. Okay. In John chapter 10, uh, John writes about how Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So again, Thinking about it from the kingdom standpoint, Jesus as the Son of God represents God the Father here on earth. They are the same entity, just different locations. 
Right. So just from those words alone, I mean, we could we could see the divinity of Jesus, that Jesus is claiming to be God. But then it's that extra layer, like you said, the whole cultural aspect of it that just hammers it home. Exactly. Okay, great. Uh, in 1037, John writes, if I do not do the works of my father, do not believe in me. And these are Jesus' words to the Jews. Um, I believe this is where he's affirming to John's disciples, um, or perhaps the Jewish rabbis, you know, but Jesus does the works of his father because, again, he's an extension of his father in heaven. But if he doesn't do what God calls us to do, then he says, don't believe in me. But Jesus did it. Um, yeah, Jesus says, but if I do them, though you do not believe me, believe the works so that you may know and understand that the Father is in me and I in the Father. So, again, with that king and prince concept of the kingdom back then, you know, the son is the father and represents the father, just in a different location. Okay. In John chapter 12, uh, Jesus says, he who sees me sees the one who sent me. So if you're seeing Jesus, you're seeing the father. In John chapter 14, uh, Jesus says, if you had known me, you would have known my father also. From now on, you know him and have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus says to him, Have I been with you so long, and you have not yet to come to know me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Yes. I am the Father. Here on Earth. Moment of frustration for Jesus. He's like, come on, guys. Come on. <laughs> yeah, smack him upside the head. He's like, pay attention. So in John chapter 16, uh, Jesus says, all things that the Father has are mine. Therefore, I said that he takes of mine and will disclose it to you. Sure. Um, so again, Jesus and the Father are one. Everything the Father has, Jesus has. And God the Father will disclose it to the disciples later on through the Holy Spirit, which is the third part of the Trinity. Okay, and there's some people out there that say, you know, Jesus never actually said the words that I am God. What would you say to those people? Um. You know, by saying that he and the Father are one, uh, you know, he says it in so many roundabout ways that it was obvious to the Jews back then that he was either at least claiming to be God or his followers recognized him as God. Um, and just by saying, you know, I, yes, I am, you know, He's claiming to be God right there. God doesn't have a name, so other than I am. So by claiming I am, he's claiming to be God. Right, and, and the Jewish leaders wouldn't have gotten so upset all those many times if he wasn't making that claim. <laughs> right, yeah. The Jewish leaders knew what he was saying, even if, you know, in our modern English times, you know, we're not saying like, well, what does I am mean? You know, you have to know your Old Testament to understand what's written in the New Testament. And you have to know your Jewish culture uh, to really understand what it's all saying. So that's why, you know, people who think that, you know, all you need is the Bible to know, understand Christianity um, are really selling themselves short. You know, there's so much more to just what's in the word of God. It's, you know, knowing history and an understanding of the culture at the time um, and other, you know, 
pre-Christian cultures, the Roman culture, the Greek culture, and the other cultures around the Middle East, you know, that influenced the Jewish culture. Um, so that's why, you know, even Protestants that claim to just go by the Bible, well, they learned an interpretation of the Bible from some guy, uh, whether they have a study Bible that has some guy's interpretation written in it, or from their pastor or Sunday school teacher, you know, somebody told them how to understand the Bible. They're not just going by the Bible. Right, because you have to understand the context, where the biblical authors were living, the culture around them, what certain words meant back then versus now. I mean, it's, and you could you find out all those things, but it's not just what we what we we could read something and it means something different in today's language than it did when it was written. Right. Um, in our modern times, you know, we have a phrase like, you know, hit the road. And that means to, you know, go out and either walk down the street or get in your car and drive down the street. Right. Um, but 2000 years from now, if somebody reads hit the road, you know, well, they went out the door and, and hammered on the road or something. Was, <laughs> why would they do that? <laughs> right. Exactly. So when you understand the culture, you understand the words better from that culture. Right. And, and that, and that leads to our discussion today. And you've, you've touched on it. You've mentioned it several times, how the ancient Jewish context of, you know, like I and the father are one meant you know, it's a whole other layer of understanding versus what we mean in our culture uh, today. Exactly. You know, when okay. we're not in our modern times, you know, especially in America where everybody is, you know, an independent person, that we work together in a common society, but, you know, we, in America, we're very proud of our independence and our ability to do what we want to do within the law and to think what we want to think within the censorship of Facebook and other social media things. And that's a whole other story for another time. Right. <laughs> Again, 2,000 years from now, people won't understand that cultural reference. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, well, Ken, do you recommend any resources that people can uh, check out to look into this topic uh, in a deeper way? Um, sure. The There's a book called The Case for Christ that's also made into a movie Excellent. by Lee Strobel. That's a great reference. Um you know, you can either read the book or watch the movie, and, you know, Lee Strobel makes a great ca case for Christ. Um, and there's a Catholic author, Matthew Kelly, he writes, a, he wrote a book called The Biggest Lie in History. And again, this shows that, you know, did was Jesus a liar, or did he actually do all the things he said he did? And did he actually rise from the dead and really was... Was he the son of God? Um, and then there's Jesus of Nazareth by Pope Benedict. You know, if you really have a lot of time to read a lot, there's only excellent. three volumes. So, you know. <laughs> They're excellent, They're though. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if you can read these things, you know. And there's a bazillion other books out there, too. But, uh, you know, these are three in three different levels that you can, you know, read and you'll it'll really affirm your belief that Jesus really is God. And for the you don't need to be afraid of anybody who challenges us for that. Right. And for anyone that's interested in the Lee Strobel movie, if you're a subscriber to Pure Flix, it is on there. I watched it there the other day. So, <laughs> so you're pretty sure that Jesus is God, right? <laughs> I'm pretty sure. I'm pretty sure. But no, if, when you, when you, and. I know we're talking about a lot about Lee Strobel here, but he was setting out to prove that Jesus wasn't who he said he was. He was an atheist and he looked through the evidence. He looked through history. He went and interviewed, he, he went and interviewed people. He interviewed Catholic priests, Protestant theologians, everyone else. Like he did a lot of homework before he concluded like, Hey, the case for Jesus is pretty, uh, iron. It's, it's pretty tight. <laughs> so right. and at, the, at the end, he had to ascent. Uh, it, it, it's, 
and I know there's there's a lot of people out there that maybe on the on the same journey that he was at one point that just learned they want to know what the truth is and they're digging deep into this and what we're doing today is looking through scripture is definitely one of those steps to do it because understanding the cultural references what words meant that's definitely a big part of it so thanks for coming on and discussing this this issue appreciate it sure thing uh, with so many different versions of Christianity out there that teach conflicting things, you know, people can easily get confused yeah. and, you know, I can understand why they might, you know, question whether Jesus really was God. But even back in the 1800s, you know, somebody, you know, researched Luke in the book of Acts and found out it to be historically accurate and they became a Christian too. So, it echoes through time. If you challenge the Bible, the Bible will show you Jesus is God. Right. Come to it with an open mind and just that search for wanting to know what the truth is. Definitely. Yeah. Look, well, Ken, what's, uh, what's going on with you? Any, any, I know you said at the top of the show, you can be on Gary's show again pretty soon. Uh, yeah. I'm on Gary's show on Monday and, uh, going to be on with the, the Catholic Canuck, uh, next Friday or next Saturday. Um, uh, you wanted to book me today, but I was booked up for today <laughs> with you. <laughs> so. David's a good guy. He understands. <laughs> uh-huh. And, you know, well, he and I are, you know, working in the same direction, you know, to help cradle Catholics better understand their faith uh, and to help bring people into the faith. Excellent. And again, Ken's book is How Old Is Your Church? An Introductory Guide to Catholic Apologetics. A uh, wide range of topics covered in there. Great resource if you're just interested in get in uh, Catholic apologetics. I highly recommend Ken's book. And where can you get the book, Ken? Where can people get the book? Uh, people can get it on Amazon. Um, if you can't afford to buy it on Amazon for six dollars or three dollars for the ebook version, send me an email at Ken Litchfield sixty one at gmail dot com, and I'll email you a PDF version. You can get it for free. Uh, so I, my goal is to get the information out there. I'm not trying to make a living off of book sales. All right. Well, check out the book. Highly recommend it guys. All right. Ken, well, God bless you. And thanks again for coming on. Thanks for having me, William. Look forward to being on with you again. All right. Take care. Thanks. God bless.